Chapter 45 Eleanor, for some time after he left her, for some time even after the sound of his carriage had died away, remained too much oppressed by a crowd of ideas, widely differing in themselves, but of which sadness was the general result, to even think of her sister. Willoughby, he whom only half an hour ago she had abhorred as the most worthless of men, Willoughby, in spite of all his faults, excited a degree of commiseration for the sufferings produced by them, which made her think of him as now separated for ever from her family with a tenderness, a regret, rather in proportion, as she soon acknowledged within herself, to his wishes than to his merits. She felt that his influence over her mind was heightened by circumstances which ought not in reason to have weight. By that person of uncommon attraction, that open, affectionate and lively manner, which it was no merit to possess, and by that still ardent love for Marianne, which it was not even innocent to indulge. But she felt that it was so long, long before she could f feel his influence less. When at last she returned to the unconscious Marianne, she found her just waking, refreshed by so long and sweet a sleep to the extent of her hopes. Eleanor's heart was full. The past, the present, the future, Willoughby's visit, Marianne's safety and her mother's expected arrival threw her altogether into an agitation of spirits which kept off every indication of fatigue and made her only fearful of betraying herself to her sister. Short was the time, however, in which that fear could affect her, for within half an hour after Willoughby's leaving the house, she was again called downstairs by the sound of another carriage. Eager to save her mother from every unnecessary moment's horrible suspense, she ran immediately into the hall and reached the outward door just in time to receive and support her as she entered it. Mrs Dashwood, whose terror as they drew near the house had produced almost the conviction of Marianne's being no more, had no voice to inquire after her, no voice even for Eleanor. But she, waiting neither for salutation nor inquiry, instantly gave the joyful relief, and her mother, catching it with all her usual warmth, was in a moment as much overcome by her happiness as she had been before by her fears. She was supported into the drawing-room, between her daughter and her friend, and there, shedding tears of joy, though still unable to speak, embraced Eleanor again and again, turning from her at intervals to press Colonel Brandon's hand, with a look which spoke at once her gratitude and her conviction of his sharing with herself in the bliss of the moment. He shared it, however, in a silence even greater than her own. As soon as Mrs Dashwood had recovered herself, to see Marianne was her first desire, and in two minutes she was with her beloved child, rendered dearer to her than ever by absence, unhappiness and danger. Eleanor's delight as she saw what each felt in the meeting, was only checked by an apprehension of its robbing Marianne of father's sleep. But Mrs Dashwood could be calm, could be even prudent, when the life of a child was at stake, and Marianne, satisfied in knowing her mother was near her, and conscious of being too weak for conversation, submitted readily to the silence and quiet prescribed by every nurse around her. Mrs Dashwood would sit up with her all night, and... Eleanor, in compliance with her mother's entreaty, went to bed. But the rest, which one night entirely sleepless and many hours of the most wearing anxiety seemed to make requisite, was kept off by irritation of spirits. Willoughby, poor Willoughby, as she now allowed herself to call him, was constantly in her thoughts. She would not but have heard his vindication for the world, and now blamed, now acquitted herself, for having judged him so harshly before. But her promise of relating it to her sister was invariably painful. She dreaded the performance of it, dreaded what its effect on Marianne might be, doubted whether after such an explanation she could ever be happy with another, and for a moment wished Willoughby a widower. Then, remembering Colonel Brandon, reproved herself, felt that to his sufferings and his constant constancy, far more than to his rivals, the reward of her sister was due, and wished anything rather than Mrs Willoughby's death. 
the shock of Colonel Brandon's errand at Barton had been much softened to Mrs. Dashwood by her own previous alarm, for so great was her uneasiness about Marianne that she had already determined to set out for Cleveland on that very day, without waiting for any farther intelligence, and had so far settled her journey before his arrival that the Careys were then expected every moment to fetch Margaret away, as her mother was unwilling to take her where there might be infection. Marianne continued to mend every day, and the brilliant cheerfulness of Mrs. Dashwood's looks and spirits proved her to be, as she repeatedly declared herself, one of the happiest women in the world. Eleanor could not hear the declaration nor witness its proofs without sometimes wondering whether her mother ever recollected Edward. But Mrs. Dashwood, trusting to the temperate account of her own disappointment, which Eleanor had sent her, was led away by the exuberance of her joy to think only of what would increase it. Marianne was restored to her from a danger in which, as she now began to feel, her own mistaken judgment in encouraging the unfortunate attachment to Willoughby had contributed to place her. And in her recovery, she had yet another source of joy unthought of by Eleanor. It was thus imparted to her as soon as any opportunity of private conference between them occurred. At last we are alone. My Eleanor, you do not yet know all my happiness. Colonel Brandon loves Marianne. He has told me so himself. Her daughter, feeling by turns both pleased and pained, surprised and not surprised, was all silent attention. You are never like me, dear Eleanor, or I should wonder at your composure now. Had I sat down to wish for any possible good to my family, I should have fixed on Colonel Brandon's marrying one of you as the object most desirable. And I believe Marianne will be the most happy with him of the two. Eleanor was half inclined to ask her reason for thinking so, because, satisfied that none founded on an impartial consideration of their age, characters or feelings could be given. But her mother must always be carried away by her, her imagination on any interesting subject, and therefore, instead of an inquiry, she passed it off with a smile. He opened his whole heart to me yesterday as we travelled. It came out quite unawares, quite undesignedly. I, you may well believe, could talk of nothing but my child. He could not conceal his distress. I saw that it equalled my own, and he perhaps thinking that mere friendship, as the world now goes, would not justify so warm a sympathy, or rather, not thinking at all, I suppose, giving way to irresistible feelings, made me acquainted with his earnest, tender, constant affection for Marianne. He has loved her, my Eleanor, ever since the first moment of seeing her. Here, however, Eleanor perceived not the language, not the professions of Colonel Brandon, but the natural embellishments of her mother's active fancy, which fashioned everything delightful to her as it chose. His regard for her infinitely surpassing anything that Willoughby ever felt or feigned, as much more warm, as more sincere or constant, whichever we are to call it, has subsisted through all the knowledge of dear Marianne's unhappy prepossession for that worthless young man, and without self selfishness, without encouraging a hope, could he have seen her happy with another? Such a noble mind, such openness, such sincerity, no one can be deceived in him. Colonel Brandon's character, said Eleanor, as an excellent man, is well established. I know it is, replied her mother seriously, or after such a warning I should be the last to encourage such affection, or even to be pleased by it. But his coming for me as he did, with such active, such ready friendship, is enough to prove him one of the worthiest of men. His character, however, answered Eleanor, does not rest on one act of kindness, to which his affection for Marianne, were humanity out of the case, would have prompted him. To Mrs Jennings, to the Middletons, he has long and intimately been known. They equally love and respect him. And even my own knowledge of him, though lately acquired, is very considerable. And so highly do I value and esteem him, that if Marianne can be happy with him, I shall be as ready as yourself to think our connection the greatest blessing to us in the world. What answer did you give him? Did you allow him to hope? Oh, my love, 
I could not then talk of hope to him or to myself. Marianne might at that moment be dying. But he did not ask for hope or encouragement. His was an involuntary confidence, an irrepressible effusion to a soothing friend, not an application to a parent. Yet after a time I did say, for at first I was quite overcome, that if she lived, as I trusted she might, my greatest happiness would lie in promoting their marriage. And since our arrival, since our delightful security, I have repeated it to him more fully, have given him every encouragement in my power. Time, a very little time, I tell him, will do everything. Marianne's heart is not to be wasted for ever on such a man as Willoughby. His own merits must soon secure it. To judge from the Colonel's spirits, however, you have not yet made him equally sanguine. No, he thinks Marianne's affection too deeply rooted for any change in it under a great length of time, and even supposing her heart again is free, is too diffident diffident of himself to believe that with such a difference of age and disposition he could ever attach her. There, however, he is quite mistaken. His age is only so much beyond hers as to be an advantage, as to make his character and principles fixed. And his disposition, I am well convinced, is exactly the very one to make your sister happy. And his person, his manners too, are all in his favour. My partiality does not blind me. He certainly is not so handsome as Willoughby. But at the same time, there is something much more pleasing in his countenance. There was always a something, if you remember, in Willoughby's eyes at times, which I did not like. Eleanor could not remember it. But her mother, without waiting for her assent, continued. And his manners, the Colonel's manners, are not only more pleasing to me than Willoughby's ever were, but they are of a kind I well know to be more solidly attaching to Marianne their gentleness, their genuine attention to other people, and their manly, unstudied simplicity is much more accordant with her real disposition than the liveliness, often artificial and often ill-timed, of the other. I am very sure myself that had Willoughby turned out as really amiable as he has proved himself the contrary, Marianne would yet never have been so happy with him as she will be with Colonel Brandon. She paused. Her daughter could not quite agree with her, but her dissent was not heard, and therefore gave no offence. At Delaford she will be within an easy distance of me, added Mrs. Dashwood, even if I remain at Barton, and in all probability, for I hear it is a large village, indeed there certainly must be some small house or cottage close by that would suit us quite well in our present situation. Poor Eleanor, here was a new scheme for getting her to Delaford but her spirit was stubborn. His fortune too, for at my time of life you know everybody cares about that. And though I neither know nor desire to know what it really is, I am sure it must be a good one. Here they were interrupted by the entrance of a third person, and Eleanor withdrew to think it all over in private, to wish success for her friend, and yet in wishing it, to feel a pang for Willoughby. Chapter 46 Marianne's illness, though weakening in its kind, had not been long enough to make her recovery slow, and with youth, natural strength, and her mother's presence in aid, it proceeded so smoothly as to enable her to remove, within four days after the arrival of the latter, into Mr. Pa Mrs. Palmer's dressing room. When there, at her own particular request, for she was impatient to pour forth her thanks to him for fetching her mother, Colonel Brandon was invited to visit her. His emotion in entering the room, in seeing her altered looks, and in receiving the pale hand which she immediately held out to him, was such as in Eleanor's conjecture, must arise from something more than his affection for Marianne, or the consciousness of it being known to others. And she soon discovered in his melancholy eye and varying complexion as he looked at her sister, the probable recurrence of many past scenes of misery to his mind, brought back by that resemblance between Marianne and Eliza already acknowledged, and now strengthened by the hollow eye, the sickly skin, the posture of reclining weakness, and the warm acknowledgement of peculiar obligation. 
Mrs. Dashwood, not less watchful of what passed than her daughter, but with a mind very differently influenced, and therefore watching to very different effect, saw nothing in the Colonel's behaviour but what arose from the most simple and self-evident sensations. While in the actions and words of Marianne she persuaded herself to think that something more than gratitude already dawned. At the end of another day or two, Marianne growing visibly stronger every twelve hours, Mrs. Dashwood, urged equally by her own and her daughter's wishes, began to talk of removing to Barton. On her measures depended those of her two friends. Mrs. Jennings could not quit Cleveland during the Dashwood's stay, and Colonel Brandon was soon brought by their united request to consider his own abode there as equally determinate, if not equally indispensable. At his and Mrs. Jennings' united request in return, Mrs. Dashwood was prevailed on to accept the use of his carriage on her journey back, for the better accommodation of her sick child. And the Colonel, at the joint invitation of Mrs. Dashwood and Mrs. Jennings, whose active good nature made her friendly and hospitable for other people as well as herself, engaged with pleasure to redeem it by a visit at the cottage in the course of a few weeks. The day of separation and departure arrived, and Marianne, after taking so particular and lengthened a leave of Mrs. Jennings, one so earnestly grateful, so full of respect and kind wishes as seemed due to her own heart from a secret acknowledgement of past inattention, and bidding Colonel Brandon farewell with the cordiality of a friend, was carefully assisted by him into the carriage, of which he seemed anxious that she should engross at least half. Mrs. Dashwood and Eleanor then followed, and the others were left by themselves, to talk of the travellers and feel their own dullness, till Mrs. Jennings was summoned to her chaise to take comfort in the gossip of her maid for the loss of her two young companions, and Colonel Brandon immediately afterwards took his solitary way to Delaford. The Dashwoods were two days on the road, and Marianne bore her journey on both without essential fatigue. Everything that the most zealous affection, the most solicitous care could do to render her comfortable was the office of each watchful companion, and each found their reward in her bodily ease and her calmness of spirits. To Eleanor, the observation of the latter was particularly grateful. She who had seen her week after week so constantly suffering, oppressed by anguish of heart, which she had neither courage to speak of nor fortitude to conceal, now saw with a joy which no other could equally share, an apparent composure of mind, which, in being the result, as she trusted, of serious reflection, must eventually lead her to contentment and cheerfulness. As they approached Barton, indeed, and entered on scenes of which every field and every tree brought some peculiar, some painful recollection, she grew silent and thoughtful, and turning away her face from their notice, sat earnestly gazing through the window. But here Eleanor could neither wonder nor blame, and when she saw, as she assisted Marianne from the carriage, that she had been crying, she saw only an emotion too natural in itself to raise anything less tender than pity, and in its unobtrusiveness entitled to praise. In the whole of her subsequent manner, she traced the direction of a mind awakened to reasonable exertion. For no sooner had they entered their common sitting-room than Marianne turned her eyes around it with a look of resolute firmness, as if determined at once to accustom herself to the sight of every object with which the remembrance of Willoughby could be connected. She said very little, but every sentence aimed at cheerfulness, and though a sigh sometimes escaped her, it never passed away without the atonement of a smile. After dinner, she would try her pianoforte. She went to it, but the music on which her eye first rested was an opera, procured for her by Willoughby, containing some of their favourite duets, and bearing on its outward leaf her own name in his handwriting. That would not do. She shook her head, put the music aside, and after running over the keys for a minute, complained of feebleness in her fingers, and closed the instrument again, declaring, however, with firmness as she did so, that she should in future practice much. The next morning produced no abatement in these happy symptoms. 
On the contrary, with a mind and body alike strengthened by rest, she looked and spoke with more genuine spirit, anticipating the pleasure of Margaret's return, and talking of the dear family party, which would then be restored, of their mutual pursuits and cheerful society, as the only happiness worth a wish. When the weather is settled and I have recovered my strength, said she, we will take long walks together every day. We will walk to the farm at the edge of the down and see how the children go on. We will walk to Sir John's new plantations at Barton Cross and the Abbey Land, and we will go often to the old ruins of the Priory and try to trace its foundation as far as we are told they once reached. I know we shall be happy. I know the summer will pass happily away. I mean never to be later in rising than six, and from that time till dinner I shall divide every moment between music and reading. I have formed my plan, and am determined to enter on a course of serious study. Our own library is too well known to me to be resorted to for anything beyond mere amusement. But there are many works well worth reading at the park, and there are others of more modern production which I know I can borrow of Colonel Brandon. By reading only six hours a day, I shall gain in the course of a twelve-month a great deal of instruction which I now feel myself to want. Eleanor honoured her for a plan which originated so nobly as this, though smiling to see the same eager fancy which had been leading her to the extreme of languid indolence and selfish repining, now at work in introducing excess into a scheme of such rational employment and virtuous self-control. Her smile, however, changed to a sigh when she remembered that her promise to Willoughby was yet unfulfilled, and feared she had that she had that to communicate which might again unsettle the mind of Marianne and ruin, at least for a time, this fair prospect of busy tranquillity. Willing, therefore, to delay the evil hour, she resolved to wait till her sister's health were more secure before she appointed it. But the resolution was made only to be broken. Marianne had been two or three days at home before the weather was fine enough for an invalid like herself to venture out. But at last a soft, genial morning appeared, such as might tempt the daughter's wishes and the mother's confidence, and Marianne, leaning on Eleanor's arm, was authorised to walk as long as she could without fatigue in the lane before the house. The sisters set out at a pace, slow as the feebleness of Marianne in an exercise hitherto untried, since her illness required, and they had advanced only so far beyond the house as to admit a full view of the hill, the important hill behind. When pausing with her eyes turned towards it, Marianne calmly said, There, exactly there, pointing with one hand. On that projecting mound, there I fell, and there I first saw Willoughby. Her voice sunk with the word. But presently reviving, she added, I am thankful to find that I can look with so little pain on the spot. Shall we ever talk on that subject, Eleanor? Hesitatingly, it was said. Or will it be wrong? I can talk of it now, I hope, as I ought to do. Eleanor tenderly invited her to be open. As for regret, said Marianne, I have done with that, as far as he is concerned. I do not mean to talk to you of what my feelings have been for him, but what they are now. At present, if I could be satisfied on one point, if I could be allowed to think that he was not always acting a part, not always deceiving me, but above all, if I could be assured that he never was so very wicked as my fears have sometimes fancied him, since the story of that unfortunate girl. She stopped. Eleanor joyfully treasured her words as she answered. If you could be assured of that, you think you should be easy. Yes, my peace of mind is doubly involved in it, for not only is it horrible to suspect a person who has been what he has been to me of such designs, but what must it make me appear to myself? What in a situation like mine? but a most shamefully unguarded affection could expose me to. How then, asked her sister, would you account for his behaviour? I would suppose him. Oh, how gladly would I suppose him only fickle. 
very, very fickle. Eleanor said no more. She was debating within herself on the eligibility of beginning her story directly or postponing it till Marianne were in stronger health, and they crept on for a few minutes in silence. I'm not wishing him too much good, said Marianne at last with a sigh, when I wish his secret reflections may be no more unpleasant than my own. He will suffer enough in them. Do you compare your conduct with his? No, I compare it with what it ought to have been. I compare it with yours. Our situations have borne little resemblance. They have borne more than our conduct. Do not, my dearest Eleanor, let your kindness defend what I know your judgment must censure. My illness has made me think. It has given me leisure and calmness for serious recollection. Long before I was enough recovered to talk, I was perfectly able to reflect. I considered the past. I saw in my own behaviour since the beginning of our acquaintance with him last autumn nothing but a series of imprudence towards myself and want of kindness to others. I saw that my own feelings had prepared my sufferings and that my want of fortitude under them had almost led me to the grave. My illness, I well knew, had been entirely brought on by myself, by such negligence of my own health as I had felt even at the time to be wrong. Had I died, it would have been self-destruction. I did not know my danger till the danger was removed, but with such feelings as these reflections gave me, I wonder at my recovery, wonder that the very eagerness of my desire to live, to have time for atonement to my God and to you all, did not kill me at once. Had I died, in what peculiar misery should I have left you, my nurse, my friend, my sister? You, who had seen all the fretful selfishness of my later days, who had known all the murmurings of my heart, how should I have lived in your remembrance? My mother, too. How could you have consoled her? I cannot express my own abhorrence of myself. Whenever I looked towards the past, I saw some duty neglected, or some failing indulged. Everybody seemed injured by me. The kindness... The unceasing kindness of Mrs Jennings I had repaid with ungrateful contempt. To the Middletons, the Palmers, the Steeles, to every common acquaintance even, I had been insolent and unjust, with a heart hardened against their merits and a temper irritated by their very attention. To John, to Fanny, yes, even to them, little as they deserve, I had given less than their due. But you... You, above all, above my mother, had been wronged by me. I and only I knew your heart and its sorrows. Yet to what did it influence me? Not to any compassion that could benefit you or myself. Your example was before me, but to what avail? Was I more considerate of you and of your comfort? Did I imitate your forbearance or lessen your restraints by taking any part in those offices of general complacence? or particular gratitude which you had hitherto been left to discharge alone? No, not less when I knew you to be unhappy than when I had believed you at ease did I turn away from every exertion of duty or friendship, scarcely allowing sorrow to exist but with me, regretting only that heart which had deserted and wronged me, and leaving you, for whom I professed an unbounded affection, to be miserable for my sake. Here ceased the rapid flow of her self-reproving spirit, and Eleanor, impatient to soothe, though too honest to flatter, gave her instantly that praise and support which her frankness and her contrition so well deserved. Marianne pressed her hand and replied, You are very good. The future must be my proof. I have laid down my plan, and if I am capable of adhering to it, my feelings shall be governed and my temper improved. They shall no longer worry others, nor torture myself. I shall now live solely for my family. You, my mother and Margaret, must henceforth be all the world to me. You will share my affections entirely between you. From you, from my home, I shall never again have the smallest incitement to move. And if I do mix in other society, it will be only to show that my spirit is humbled, my heart amended and that I can practice the civilities, the lesser duties of life, with gentleness and forbearance. 
As for Willoughby, to say that I shall soon or that I shall ever forget him would be idle. His remembrance can be overcome by no change of circumstances or opinions, but it shall be regulated, it shall be checked by religion, by reason, by constant employment. She paused and added in a lower voice, If I could but know his heart, everything would become easy. Eleanor, who had now been for some time reflecting on the propriety or impropriety of speedily hazarding her narration, without feeling at all near a decision that at first, heard this, and perceiving that, as reflection did nothing, resolution must do all, soon found herself leading to the fact. She managed the recital, as she hoped, with address, prepared her anxious listener with caution, related simply and honestly the chief points on which Willoughby grounded his apology, did justice to his repentance, and softened only his protestations of present regard. Marianne said not a word. She trembled. Her eyes were fixed on the ground, and her lips became whiter than even sickness had left them. A thousand inquiries sprung up from her heart, but she dared not urge one. She caught every syllable with panting eagerness. Her hand, unknowingly to herself, closely pressed her sister's, and tears covered her cheeks. Eleanor, dreading her being tired, led her towards home. Until they reached the door of the cottage, easily conjecturing what her curiosity, curiosity must be, though no question was suffered to speak it, talked of nothing but Willoughby and their conversation together and was carefully minute in every particular of speech and look where minuteness could safely be indulged. As soon as they entered the house, Marianne, with a kiss of gratitude, and these two words just articulate through her tears, Tell Mamma, withdrew from her sister, and walked slowly upstairs. Eleanor would not attempt to disturb a solitude so reasonable as what she now sought and with a mind anxiously prearranging its result, and a resolution of reviving the subject again, should Marianne fail to do it, she turned into the parlour to fulfil her parting injunction. <laughs>